Um, yeah, welcome to my talk um, about uh, how to prepare your ap grid application for the next major um, uh, grid version. Um, my name is uh, Harald Pehl. I'm uh, I work for Red Hat, and uh, at Red Hat, I'm uh, I'm leading the um, the Wildfly management console, which is actually a grid application. Uh, so, for those who don't know, oh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So for, the, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Wildfly, uh, that's an application server from Red Hat. It was formerly known as JBoss application server. And uh, we have um, a management console, um, and that's actually what I want to talk, uh, talk today about. Um, and I'm working um, with a management console for quite some time now, and uh, we started right away with using Quid. Um, so you can uh, get some more infos reading my blog, and uh, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. So, but this talk uh, actually is, is going to be about um, the management console and how we um, how we prepare or how, what, what we did to prepare for the next major version of Quid. Um, so the the management console is is pretty old. It's um, the first commit was was back in 2008, and uh, Today, as the, the, the current code base uses um, most most part of the current uh, grid APIs like uh, cell widgets, the normal widgets, uh, we have deferred binding, um, and uh, we have uh, code generators um, on um, uh, based on on the deferred binding. So it's pretty much uh, all of what what grid actually offers is, is used by by the management console. And we decided uh, that it's time to uh, make a fresh start, and uh, we decided for the upcoming changes um, uh, towards Grid 3.0 uh, that it's time to um, rewrite a lot of stuff um, to, pre to be prepared for the future. So um, we called it HAL Next, the, the next major version. Um, uh, and we ask ourselves, okay, what, what can we do? So we have a, a pretty big code base. It's about 150,000 uh, lines of code. So it's, it's a pretty much co a pretty big code base, and we want to, we wanted to reuse as much code as possible. So we already have some separation uh, between the user interface and the the business logic. So we have, uh, for instance, logic which talks to the application server, which makes the async the the uh, remote calls. Uh, which works with some model which is provided by the application server, and uh, we wanted to reuse this code, uh, this code as, as much as possible. Uh, but we decided that it's that it's a good opportunity to get rid of some old and legacy code, so that uh, we have decided to rewrite most of the user interface uh, actually. Uh, before diving into details. I'd like to give you just a quick overview uh, what the uh, management console is, is all about. So it's um, it's the um, it's a console you, you're using to configure your the, the application server and uh, to do some deployments to configure specific stuff on the on the application server. So there are some top level categories like uh, changing a specific configuration. Uh, for instance, uh, if you want to change um, the log level of the application server. You can use the navigation to drill down into a, spe a specific part of the application server. And uh, here you have uh, different options. For instance, you can change, um, yeah, let's say you want to change the, the, the root um, uh, the, the root logger to change the, uh, the log level um, to debug. Um, you, you're using this form and then you have uh, another another top level categories which is, is about runtime information and um, what what current servers server groups are running on the application servers or you can drill down into a specific uh, server and for instance take a look at the at the log files um, and then you you, you will see um, and, and and to trace some errors or something like that um, you can see uh, this, so the log files so this is um, this is the, the actual management console, and the version we are looking right now uh, is already the, the next major version, so we have rewritten lots of stuff. Um, and though actually um, when, you, when, you, when you want to prepare, uh, the, the, the major part is now about how you, 
actually can compare, uh, uh, prepare for with 3.0. And uh, you can ask yourself, well, uh, there's not much information really what, 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 what will be Quit 3.0 actually all about. So uh, that's why uh, there are certain parts which might change or which uh, uh, most probably will change. And these parts I'm going, going to look at in, in the next few slides. So uh, I think the, um, um, the, the main thing you can s t uh, already say is that you d don't have to panic. So uh, as I said, um, there's not much inf information now about Quit 3.0, and uh, the current version of uh, Quit 2.8 will be a long-term long -term support. So you can be sure that if you have an application which is working right now for 2.8, uh, you have a, you have enough time to to make some migration to change things. Uh, you don't have to change anything at uh, everything at all. So you can take a step by step approach. Um, for for our application for the management console, we we did um, we, we we did a fresh start. So we we, we reused uh, the business logic, but we uh, changed uh, lots of code for the for the user interface. And this is um, the first part I'm, I'm, I'd like to talk about. So this is uh, mostly uh, what we did in, in our application, I, and I hope that um, there will be some hints or suggestions for you guys if you have a similar application or if you have applications right now running on 2.8, and maybe uh, hopefully you will have get some advice uh, what works, what worked for us, um, and what what you can do in your application. So uh, for the user interface, we decided to be uh, very lightweight. So we, we used to have lots of grid witches and cell witches. Um, and we decided to, to uh, get rid of them and to use what, what's, what's there already in 2.8. And that's uh, basically the elemental um, API. So we try on using uh, element and the basic DOM elements whenever possible. So. As you see, in the, as you saw in the, in the demo, we have um, these, these forms and these uh, different user interface elements, and they are all based on, on just on the, on the basic DOM elements. So the goal was um, to remove all the, all the grid widgets, which, which took some time, but once you have a foundation and a small API you can use, it's, it really pays out, and uh, it's, it's much it's a much cleaner DOM tree you get at the, in the end. So when I compare the, the DOM tree of the current management console, which is quite deep and nested, to the one we have now with HAL Next, that's a, a, a real difference and it, it, it pays out in terms of performance. Um, and we came up with, with uh, something we, which we call builders and templates. So we have a, a small API which we're using to uh, build DOM, DOM trees. Um, which, you, which, which looks like uh, similar to this uh, code snippet we, we, uh, you see here on the screen. So there's, um, there's an, an, an API or a builder API which you can use to uh, create um, your DOM tree on the fly and we have uh, some convenience methods for instance to apply CSS styles uh, to attach um, um, event handlers and this this works very well for us. Uh, we use this kind of uh, of code all over the place. And in, in the end, this is just uh, producing um, the elemental, uh, the few elemental uh, elements and, and objects. So that's very lightweight. And another technique we are using is that we are reusing, try to reuse uh, HTML snippets. So we have. Um, like um, HTML files, um, which which describe the, the user interface, and then we have these data element uh, attributes, which we are using to inject the elements into our uh, into our instances and in, into our objects. Um, and we have a, a little a little helper helper methods or little uh, convenience methods. Uh, if you see these curly braces uh, in in the code. Uh, we can. We are making use of handlebars, so something like a handlebar, so that you can inject um, dynamic parts into your HTML, and this got, gets mapped to, for instance, to a class like this, uh, where you annotate your your um, your, uh, your view class um, and reference a, a specific HTML snippet. And then you can use the annotations to map the uh, elements from the HTML into your, into your class. And this works pretty straightforward. It's, it's backed by an annotation processor. 
which generate then the actual uh, view class. And um, yeah, this is uh, pretty useful for us. Um, the, the big advantage we have using uh, HTML is that we can have a preview. So you can just open the HTML file in the browser. You get a really nice preview. You can play around with the HTML, tweak some CSS styles. And um, when you are happy with it, then just uh, map it to your class, uh, and um, it, works uh, it works out really well for us. So, and we even uh, took a step further uh, in our application mm. because um, in our application in the management console we have lots of screens which look very similar. So there are some building blocks which uh, which repeat. Uh, in, in which repeat themselves in the in the management console, we have things like forms and tables, and these screens to configure the, the application server are very 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 similar. Um, and we we have a, a specific metadata we can load from the application server. So there are there is metadata about how uh, a specific form uh, would look like in terms of uh, what are the attributes, what are the allowed values. Um, it, are the attributes required and things like that. And we make use of this uh, metadata information and that's why we came up with, the, with an uh, XML description for the user interface, uh, which is again uh, picked up by an annotation processor and which is uh, bound to some defaults and to some reasonable, reasonable configuration. And actually uh, what we can do now is uh, to describe um, a complete user interface uh, using some uh, XML dialect. Um, and then this, uh, this XML is, turned by a, is picked up by an annotation processor and then generated into a, into, a, um, uh, into a specific class or into a specific object. And this saves us a lot of uh, boilerplate code. So because we have, um, uh, we have very often we have these default actions to add a configuration, to modify a configuration, and this, this XML is then turned into a class which already comes with the forms, uh, with, the, with the dialogues to add new resources, um, and has lots of default configuration and default logic uh, already provided for you. And um, yeah, I only can recommend if you have an application with, where you have common building blocks, it, it really makes sense to, um, to try to automate these things using annotation processing. So you can do lots of, lots of stuff, amazing stuff with annotation processors. And this really pays out if you, if you, ha if you write, uh, have to write these kind of building blocks all over the place. So um, speaking of widgets, I already um, talked about how that we want to, wanted to get rid of the widgets in our application. And uh, to replace the widget, yeah, we decided that it, 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 we really want to keep it simple. Um, so we, we used the DOM elements and the elemental API whenever possible. Um, you could also use uh, web components. There's um, support for, to, to, to include or to uh, embed web components in GRID nowadays. So that should, shouldn't be a problem. And for, for other stuff, uh, which is more complex, uh, we just when we, when we discover that we need uh, more complex objects or more comple uh, com complex elements, uh, we just write them by ourselves. So we, I will show you uh, in a minute uh, what, what that looks like. And then we make heavy use of JS interop. So we have these uh, more complex widgets or, or uh, components like uh, tables and trees or the ACE editor, the editor which you just saw um, when you want to look at the log file, for instance. And that w that's why we embrace the existing um, JavaScript ecosystem. So uh, we have um, we have uh, there's an there's a library from Red Hat which is called Patternfly, and Patternfly uh, is is a, is a is a layer above Bootstrap. So it gives you a common look and feel. It gives you um, some really useful components, and it's used in inside Red Hat uh, for many different management consoles, though that they all have a common look and feel. But it's also open source. So I encourage everybody to take a look at the Patternfly library. Um, there are some UX designers working um, on Patternfly, and they really have uh, have done a good job. So they are um, ready to use components, uh, very well thought out uh, patterns, and um, they are thinking about how to really improve the usability of an application. Um, 
Yeah, and we uh, we make use of these these different libraries and use JS interop to have a thin layer above them and then uh, to use them in our application. So here's an example for for instance uh, if we uh, if we have a custom element, um, we just have a little small uh, a very tiny interface which is called is element. This maybe you you know the is widget uh, interface from the from the grid API, and this is the idea is just to have a counterpart for the for the elemental uh, side. So all you have uh, to do is actually override a method as element, and this gives you back the the root element of your of your component. And this can be quite simple as it is in, in this case, but it can be also very complex. Uh, it's very flexible, I think. It's very easy to understand. And all, um, so you could have um, your own custom uh, event listeners inside your element, um, or it can be just as easy as in this case, um, which is just an, an, an OL tag with a list of nested LE elements. And uh, finally, they, then you apply it a specific style and you have a nice looking breadcrumb, for instance. And I guess, yeah, uh, you all know, uh, already saw uh, lots of examples for, for uh, attaching the, or for leverage on the JS Interop API. So in th this example, we are making use of the bootstrap model um, element or component. And we took an approach that we start very small and just the, uh, uh, match the or, uh, or export the methods we really need. And then when we discover that we need more, uh, we, we just add more code to this class so that it can grow. But we, we, we try to start minimal and, and to, to include only the stuff we need um, to have uh, some, some callbacks which we, which we want to have. And um, yeah, in this example, there's also some, some convenience methods, some chase overlay methods. So this, this uh, works for us very well um, to start very small and then to grow uh, if, if necessary. So the next uh, thing I want to, uh, want to talk about is um, CSS and styling. So um, there are different, or there are many options. Uh, um, we evaluated to, uh, in, in the current code base, we are using uh, CSS resources. And though when we decided to make the switch to the next major version of our application, we, we, we took a look at the GSS uh, resources, for instance. Uh, we took a look to, to other ways how to CSS, how to do a CSS and how to do styling in, in the application. And we came up with a solution um, this, this has some uh, advantages, but also some drawbacks. Um, so we end up uh, using less, um, and that's the reason for using less is that uh, the pattern fly library, uh, which we heavily use in our application, already comes with a, se uh, with a set of less files. And that's why we uh, import those less files, and then we include our own less files on top of that. And this works, uh, quite, this works quite okay for us. And then we, we try to follow some best practices. So the, there are lots of best practices around how to organize CSS styles. There are some uh, methodology called uh, BEM, which stands for Block Element Modifier. I uh, encourage everybody to take a look at that. So, and then there's a, a guy called Harry, um, I don't know if you remember his name, but he, he published a CSS guideline. And this is really uh, a good read. So there are lots of best practices in it, uh, recommendations, how to name your CSS uh, classes, how to keep them manageable. And we try to follow these, uh, these uh, best, best practices. And then what we did, uh, because we wanted to have some way to, uh, we wanted to avoid having the CSS classes hard coded or uh, as strings in, in, our, in our application. So we just, uh, took a, a very simple approach. And we have just an interface with, um, with uh, static uh, strings in it. And whenever we use a, a, an additional uh, CSS class, we just add an, uh, a constant to, this, to the CSS interface. We have also some convenience method in the, in the interface uh, to apply some font awesome um, style classes. Um, there are some other uh, convenience methods to uh, to have the columns of the bootstrap to, to get uh, to create uh, CSS classes for the bootstrap columns. Um, it's a very simple approach, but it works 
um, quite quite okay for us. So um, at least you get some um, some support in terms of the IDE. If there's a CSS class which is no longer used, you will detect it in the in the um, in the IDE and can remove this class again. It has some drawbacks compared to things like uh, GSS resources, where you have some some uh, uh, more integration, um, but. Uh, on the other hand, you can use the CSS classes in the HTML preview, and you can uh, work with them. You can uh, change them, and there's uh, you and and you can make use of the less uh, CSS style sheets, which is uh, important for for us. Um, yeah, and then um, using this this builder like API, which we which you already saw. Uh, we just use the, or we include these uh, CSS classes statically uh, in the code, and then you can just reference them uh, from your uh, from your builder, and you get at least something, uh, some some code completion. Uh, so that's um, that that works for us, and uh, it's it's a simple solution, but um, I think um, it's at least some support for CSS styles. Um, so the next topic uh, I want to talk about is uh, how we, um, what we what we did in terms of a model view presenter um, uh, framework. There, there is some support in in, in the current grid um, API about uh, for for these kind of, of patterns like um, the activities and places. Uh, we we are using a, um, a framework called uh, GoodDP from from ArcBees. So. Uh, I think many of, of you might know this. Uh, this is uh, an MVP framework which has a simple but very powerful uh, history management uh, where you can nest your presenters, uh, which makes use of the event bus from the grid uh, API, um, which also has, comes with some support for code splitting. And uh, we actually we wanted to, to we wanted to reuse this uh, in, in the next major version of our application. Uh, the only problem we have is that this uh, the GoodDP is, uh, is based on widgets, so the, the views are actually widgets, and these widgets then get uh, attached to uh, to the to the browser, and that's why we came up with a little adapter between, to map between the widget world of the GoodDP framework and our world, which which basically works with element uh, elements, and. It's just a very uh, small interface um, which uh, extends from the view interface from GoodDP, uh, but also it implements the. Oops. Uh, it seems that I, I have lost. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but with uh, the interface, all, all uh, also uh, implements our own is element uh, interface. And that's uh, that's the bridge we are using, or that, uh, the adapter to map uh, between the widget world from the GoDP and and our uh, our elements. And then we have some root presenter, which takes care to attach or to uh, append these views uh, to the to the DOM tree um, uh, in the end. Um, then we uh, you usually have some some server side. Um, uh, logic you want to talk about, so there's um, some some ways you you can use in in the in the grid API. Um, so there's this uh, RPC uh, technique, which uh, I think most probably will will go away um, in the next in the next major version of, of grid. Then there's this request factory, which actually we used in in the in, in our application to make um, the the calls to the backend. And that's that we sw uh, we switched that to just using the plain XML HTTP request, um, and then you have you ca you can have um, it depends on your application. Uh, most of you maybe have JSON uh, are using JSON as payload or XML or some other kind of format. What we are doing, we have a special f uh, payload in our application, uh, which is uh, a base uh, 64 encoded format. So, but in the end, actually, it, it doesn't really uh, matters what, what kind of payload you have. So, my recommendation is just to use the uh, to stick with the with the things uh, which come with the Elemental API, and that's the XML HTTP request. Um, and then we came up 
uh, with a central class. Um, so that's, that's, that's something which uh, really works out for us as, very well. So we have a central class which we call dispatcher. And this uh, central class provides a high level API to make the calls and um, takes care of all, of all the low level stuff like error handling or timeouts and, and, and things like that. So uh, in our case, this is just um, a simple class which uh, has a few public methods. Uh, in our case, um, we, we, ex we usually execute operations um, against the, the, the backend. Uh, and these operations are operations to either read the configuration, to make modifications to the, the, the application server configuration. Uh, we have also the use case that we want to apply, upload some, some deployments to the application server and therefore we have some, uh, some, some public methods in this, uh, in this class. And then uh, you provide a callback and uh, get a result either if the, if the operation failed or if there was a, a, successful, a, success, a successful operation. Um, yeah, so uh, the, next, the next topic I, I, I want to touch is to uh, is the deferred binding. Um, yeah, the deferred binding, um, actually we, we had some, quite, some, quite a lot of code around deferred binding in our application and uh, we, we removed this uh, deferred binding and replaced it uh, with annotation processors. So that's, that's a recommendation uh, uh, to really get rid of, uh, of the different binding as soon as pop possible, but because that's definitely uh, is, is going away um, over the next uh, versions of, of GWT. Um, and it turns out that the annotation processors are really powerful. You can do uh, really amazing stuff with annotation processing. There's already uh, very good support for, um, for, for annotation processes. There are lots of libraries from Google, for instance. Um, we came up with some tiny or little framework which we are using. So we use uh, free marker templates. So we use a template mechanism to describe the, the, the source we want to generate. And then there are dynamic parts in the source uh, and in the end, um, um, the actual source code gets gets generated. Um, so this, uh, for instance, looks like um, like like you see on 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 the slide. So this is a free marker template we are using to generate a, a specific code, which is uh, which is about um, dependency inje injection, um, and then. Um, the, the IDE, I think uh, Eclipse has some support for it, or IntelliJ, which, we, which I'm using. Um, you can give some hints as, as comments uh, about, the, um, about the variables you're using in your template. So this gives you, for instance, code completion in your template. And uh, in the end, it's, it's, it's a question of per personal taste. Uh, um, lots of people like to programmatically generate the code using some, uh, some tools. Um, I like to uh, to write these uh, these free marker templates because then you get a notion of, of the code which actually gets generated and uh, so you at least uh, if you're looking at the template you, you get an idea okay what's what's happening and what what kind of code uh, gets generated in, the, in this case and using these templates you have a few uh, statements you, you, you can use like uh, you have a, a for each loop or you have ifs and else, just a limited set of functionality, but using these techniques, techniques um, there's actually, uh, you can actually do everything uh, you, you, you need to do. Um, and the other, the other um, thing we are using um, is, um, well, when you have uh, uh, your annotation processes and you have lots of them, usually they, they tend to, be quite, uh, to become quite complex or they can become quite complex. And actually you want to, uh, you want to verify and test um, that the code which get, gets generated actually um, is the, the, the code you, you're expecting to, to, uh, to be generated. And uh, there's an, uh, a really cool library from Google um, which, uh, uh, which helps you to test your, generated, uh, your, your annotation processors. So what you do is that you actually invoke the Java C compiler and specify some options. And the options are for in, uh, what, what, what kind of annotation processor you want to test or what you want to use. And then this, um, this 
this uh, Java file you're referencing gets gets compiled. The anno annotation processor is, uh, is is run, and in the end you can compare uh, the generated source file to the to to a, a specific uh, resource you're specifying. And so the comparison uh, comparison is not about uh, like line by line or character by character. So what actually is compared is the abstract syntax tree or the that the, the, the these two files actually are uh, equal in a sense uh, of, of, of Java source code. So it doesn't matter if you have a, a comment for instance in one file and the comment is missing in the other file. Um, that doesn't uh, really matter. It's just about having the right statements in the right order, that the import statements are, are, are correct, that the naming of the variables are named equally and things like that. So this turns out to be quite quite useful and actually it gives you a very good test coverage for your uh, uh, annotation processors. So, um, yeah, and, and uh, actually the, the last uh, topic I have is, is about how to debug, run and build uh, your, your application, though this is not so really not so um, related to, to Quit 3.0, but it's more kind of recommendation what uh, worked for us. Um, and um, so what we are using is um, uh, we have a Maven mo uh, multi uh, module, or we have many, ma many Maven modules in our application. So there are something about um, 18 uh, modules um, and lots of them um, dealing with configuration and uh, half of them are dealing actually with, 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 with code. Um, and we use the Maven plugin from uh, Thomas Breuer, which uh, really worked out well for us, uh, especially when you have a Maven module, um, a multi-module, though this, this is quite useful. Um, and then we have these uh, external JavaScript dependencies, uh, like the data tables, the ACE editor, or Bootstrap. And we are using uh, the, uh, a Maven plugin, which is called Frontend Maven plugin. And this uh, enables you to, uh, to call NPM, which we are using to uh, manage the build time JavaScript dependencies, like uh, Bower or like Grunt. Then we have actually uh, then uh, we have uh, we are using Bower to uh, describe our JavaScript dependencies for the external frameworks we are using, and then we have a grunt file uh, which we uh, which we use to um, compile all the less uh, style sheets we are using, uh, which collects all the external JavaScript dependencies and um, concatenate these external JavaScript dependencies in one big file. Um, yeah, and this, uh, for instance, is our our Bower configuration. Uh, so here you can see a task list, the dependencies we are using, the data tables, uh, the jQuery version, um, the pattern fly version we are using, and this is then uh, all part of your Maven build. So um, at last. Um, I quickly want to touch some some things which are which we don't have a, found a solution for right now in our application. So, um, so that's something we we need to think uh, about um, for some alternatives. Mm, and for our in our case, that's uh, mostly related to the client bundles and the internationalization. So we make heavy use of uh, of resource bundles in our application. The the console. Uh, supports up to six different languages, so we have uh, lots of resource bundles, uh, strings, we have some, some images and some text resources uh, which we're using and these are all uh, are part of client bundles and uh, I'm not sure what will happen to these client bundle APIs uh, in, the, in the next quit version, so we will see. Uh, at least it is supported, or it is, I think uh, it's supported in, in 2.8 and it will be there for quite a long time. But at some day we might think for uh, we might think about some alternatives uh, for this uh, for this part. Uh, the same is true for the dependency injection. So as we are using the GoodEP framework, and uh, GoodEP uses uh, Chin for dependency injection, and uh, Chin is, is uh, makes heavily use of the deferred binding. And so this will at some day maybe uh, no longer work. So we, we might think to, to migrate to something like Dagger or some similar approach. So yeah, I think I was very fast. So 
um, the, thanks for attending my talk. Thanks.